And this week's title, message title is self-love. Self-love. I don't know if you've ever come across that term, but I'll get there in a moment. But, but I want to I remind you of the, the part of the Bible, so a couple of verses in the Bible that we've been looking at. And it's this one here in Matthew chapter 22. And a, a Jewish man came to Jesus and, uh, and he, said to, he asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in the Bible? And Jesus' response was this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So the last few weeks I've been talking about that first commandment, which is about loving God. And if you want to know about that, then go on to YouTube and, and, or our Facebook page and then you'll see that. Today I wanted to talk, start talking about the second command. And these two commands make up the greatest command. And the second is just as important as the first, in other words. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Ever thought about that? Love your neighbor. So love other people like you love you. Ever thought about it like that? Love your neighbor as you love yourself, in other words. Self-love. What, if, what, what's, what jumps to your mind when you think of self-love? Anything, anything comes to mind? What comes to mind? Self-love. You know, one thing that comes to my mind is a scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 3 where where Paul says that self-love, he he associates love for, for self as things like pride, being boastful. So, so in that context, when he's talking about self-love, loving self, he's talking about it in a selfish way. So selfishness. But that's not what Jesus is talking about, is it? He's not talking about a selfishness. You know, sometimes I think in this world, either we think about loving ourselves too much, so a prideful type of love, or we think of self-loathing. So either, you know, I'm just full of myself, or I hate myself. Ever felt like that? I remember I used to hate myself. I remember when, when I was about 19 years of age and, and I just felt so despised by my father, I couldn't help but loathe myself. Thank God I'm not there now. But we need to understand what real self-love is because we don't want to be a, a selfish person. We don't want to think all about ourselves all the time, but we also don't want to loathe ourselves. Here's something that, we, that not everyone realizes. Jesus was actually quoting Leviticus, part of the Old Testament. He was quoting Leviticus. I'm just going to read you out the section that he quotes so we understand where Jesus is coming from. Here's a list in the Old Testament about how we should treat one another bit like the Ten Commandments, but it's not related to God. It's about love, about how we treat each other. Do not steal. Do not act deceptively or lie to one another. Do not swear falsely by my name, profaning the, the name of God. Do not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages due a hired worker must not re- remain with you until morning. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind. But you are to fear your God. Do not act unjustly when deciding a case. Do not be partial to the poor or give preference to the rich. Judge a neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not jeopardize your neighbor's life. Do not harbor hatred against your brother. Rebuke your neighbor directly and you will not incur guilt because of him. Do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community. But love your neighbor as yourself. This phrase is almost like a summary. How 
how do you treat each other? You're meant to love them. What is love? Well, it, it includes all those types of things. In some ways, loving the neighbor is really about looking after them. How do you love your neighbor? Well, Leviticus is talking about treat them how you would want to be treated yourself. But one of the things that we always notice when Jesus quotes the Old Testament almost always is that he brings new revelation. He's not just pointing back to the Old Testament and say, do what the Old Testament said. He, he is doing that often at times, but usually he's adding more revelation. He's bringing new, adding new truth to what's already been said, almost like a clarification of what Jesus or what God's heart was really about. And you see this in Romans chapter 13. This is Paul speaking, and he quotes the Old Testament, and he says this, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. When you think about love, loving other people, have you ever thought about it that? Love does no harm to a neighbor. Love doesn't hurt. Whatever we do, if we want to love people, it can't hurt them. So he leaves us with this question. How is it possible to love this way? How do we love? How do we love like that? Ever been hurt? Ever hurt someone else? God commands us to love so we don't hurt anyone. But here's the question. How do we do it? How do we love someone that way? I'm not sure I can. I've tried and I've failed. I've tried to love, but I've failed. How, how do we live up to that commandment of God? To love my neighbor as myself. How do I do that? Well, like the last week, I posed this question, what is love? What is love? And I think we need to ask that question again. Here's a good question. How do I love someone that's hurt me? God wants us to love everyone, right? Love my neighbor as myself. But how do I love someone that's hurt me? That's a practical question that we all face. Think of someone that's hurt you. Maybe it's maybe someone that's in your family. Maybe it's your, a parent. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a friend. How do you love that person that's hurt you? One of the things that we need to clarify is let, let's not confuse God loving you and God being pleased with you. And I think this is a distinction that I'll, I'll use to describe God, and I think it will help us to clarify how we love other people. God loves us, unconditional, no conditions attached. He loves us. It's got nothing to do with anything that we do, or we don't do. He loves us. It's unconditional. There is no conditions attached to God's love. But it's not the same as God being pleased with us. Because to please someone, there are conditions attached. For, for us to please God, there are things that we need to do to please Him. And the reverse is true. There's certain things that we do, like hurt people and evil things, you, we clearly know don't, doesn't please God. So if we do something evil, God's not pleased with that, but he still loves us. You know, when you're a parent, you discover that. You discover that in the first couple of years of having a child. There are plenty of things that Liberty did as a child that was not pleasing to me. But it didn't stop me loving her. 
there were plenty of things that, that Stephen did when he was a, a child. But even though it didn't please me, I never stopped loving him. So just because someone does something wrong does not affect the love that God has for them. And, and we need to be able to clarify these between these two things when we're talking about loving each other. There may be things that other people do that displease you, but that doesn't mean that you can't love someone else. See, love is about someone's character. It's the character of God. God is love. That is his essence. That is his character. That doesn't change. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter where we go, what we say, what we do. God will always love us. But that doesn't mean he's always pleased with what we do. Let me give you another de definition of love. I... I, I Explained last week, God, God's love is seen through action and also our love is seen through action. So if, if love is not in action, then it doesn't exist. Love doesn't exist unless it's actually acted on. Here's another way to describe God's love. Unconditional acceptance of an imperfect person. Anyone imperfect here? If you're imperfect, just raise your hand and, and the more imperfect you are, raise it up. You know, all of us. <laughs> the first part of love is unconditional acceptance of an imperfect person. It's unconditional. It's accepting that you are who you are. The good, the bad, the ugly. That's, that's, that's the essence of love. But it doesn't finish there. It's not just accepting that we're imperfect. It starts there. But it's also an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person to bring them to their intended purpose. You see, when God created us from his love, he had a purpose for us. He, he created us with, with a, a dream, a vision of what we would become. So he knows how imperfect we are and he loves us. That's unconditional. But there's not just an unconditional of acceptance of the way things are now. There's also an unconditional commitment to bring us to a place of his intended purpose. You see, the reason why we all exist is because God had that purpose. He didn't just create us to be imperfect. He created us to change, to go on a journey and to fulfill the purpose he had for us. So when we're talking about loving our neighbor as ourself, it's not about loving an imperfect person and just leaving them there and just accepting the way they are, that's part of it. That's, that's accepting reality. I grew up and in, an, in an environment where I have to say I didn't feel very loved. I never heard the words, I love you. I didn't feel love. But it was, never, it was never God's intention for me to stay that way. Same with the people around me. It wasn't God's intention, imperfect as, as, as loved as they were and imperfect as they were, it was never God's intention for them to stay like that. It's accept, you have to accept that. That's the reality. You let, let's not be deceived Listen, it's not about pretending everyone is perfect. They're not. But the second part of love is, is from certainly from God's perspective, is to go, as imperfect as you are, I want to see you change. I want to see you fulfill the purpose for which I created you. Here's my, what I know. Everyone in this room now has been hurt. 
Everyone in this room has suffered evil, had suffered because of evil acts against them, on whatever level that is. God's not saying that's okay. That was not okay. God's not saying you should just put up with that, that you just need to love them and accept them. No, he's, he's saying, understand, he's saying, yes, that is reality. And I love that person that hurt you. But his expectation is, is that wouldn't stay there. That, that his expectation is that that person would change if they surrendered them, themselves to God. Let me just say, if, if you've been in an abusive relationship, God is not saying to stay in that relationship. That's not what I'm saying. You can love that person and still do the wise thing and exit that relationship. Staying in an abusive relationship is not love. But regardless of how bad it is, God still loves that person, God still loves you, and God is committed to seeing that change. Now, whether we cooperate with God in that journey is is our choice. But here's the question that's still raised. How is it possible to love this way? How do we love our neighbour as ourselves? How do we love our neighbour as God loves us? How do we do that? Because I know in our human frailty and weakness, that is a tall order. To answer that question, I want to divert slightly. And I want to introduce you to the one Jesus loved. I want to introduce you to the one, the one Jesus loved. Ever heard that term? Here's a few verses in the Bible. This comes from John chapter 13, 23. One of his disciples, the one Jesus loved, was reclining close beside Jesus. Here's another one. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Here's another verse. So Mary Magdalene went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. John chapter 21, the disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. John chapter 21, verse 20, so Peter turned around and saw the disciple Jesus loved following them. The one who had leaned back against Jesus. Anyone know who the the one Jesus loved is? You know, it's very interesting because You see these statements in the Bible. God so loved the world. God so loved the world. So God loves the whole world. He loves all the people. Yet, in the Gospels, there's one who's referred to as the one Jesus loved. And, of course, we're talking about the Apostle John. The guy who actually wrote the Gospel of John, where I've quoted all those verses from. So here's a disciple John, and when he writes the gospel, the way he refers to himself is the one whom Jesus loved. Isn't that interesting? Why would he do that? God, Jesus loved, Jesus loved Peter. Je, Jesus loved all the other disciples. What's really interesting is he refers to himself is the one Jesus loved. Ever, ever, ever come across a Christian that refers to himself that way? Hi, what's your name? I'm the one Jesus loved. I, I think that it reveals something quite special. John had a revelation of the personal love of Jesus that perhaps the other disciples didn't have. I want to take you now to 1 John and I, and I want to look closely at a couple of things he said because I think these 
are keys to how we can love others as God loves us. Let's, let's have a look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. It says this. I, sh- I, I talked about this last week. This is love. This is a definition of love. This is God's definition of love. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. This is love. Not not that we had the capacity to love God. That's not love. No. What defines love is that he loved us. What is he saying? Well, he says it more explicitly in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love, we love now because he first loved us. The only reason that we can love is that God loved us first. The only way that we have capacity to love other people is that first he loved us. It's nothing in our in of, of ourselves. Like we don't have capacity to love God. We don't have capacity to love other people. In ourselves. Without with like with every like, you know, I'm gonna really try hard now to love. We, you don't have that. If you've tried that method, let me tell you, you're gonna fail. You just in the face of bad things, evil, of being hurt, of unforgiveness, of people mistreating you, whether intentionally or unintentionally. In the face of all those things, you do not have the capacity in yourself to love other people like God loves us. But he first loved us. Loving others as yourself starts with first Receiving God's love, in other words. The only way, the only way we have, can possibly have the capacity to love other people is that first we receive God's love. Have you received God's love? And I ask that question because I don't believe that necessarily, as a Christian, that you would have necessarily received God's love. I don't necessarily think that's the same thing as getting saved or coming to faith in Jesus. John knew that he was loved. He knew he was loved. He knew it so much, that's how he referred to himself. Not all the others thought like that. You don't see Peter in his writing say, the one whom Jesus loved. Now, I'm sure he, he did know that Jesus loved him. But there was a love that was received by John in a very tangible way, a very conscious way, a very experientially, experiential way that made him believe from the the deepest level of his being, that he was loved. I am the one who Jesus loved. First John, he says this, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. The only possible way we can love our neighbour as ourself is firstly that we know, like John knew, we know, we know that we are loved by Jesus. We know that. We know that deep down. And then we rely on that. We rely on that. We have to rely on that. There's no way to love others like God loves them unless we rely on that. We're not relying on our own capacity to love. We're relying on his love in us. Just for a moment, going back to the verse I started 
with Matthew chapter 22, Jesus um, says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love God with everything you are, your whole being, the entirety of your being, every part of you, in other words. That's what he's saying. Your heart, your soul, and your mind. Here's the thing. Why does he, why is that phrase like that? Well, I think it's because God loves every part of us, the good and the bad. He loves every part of us, and he expects every part of us to love him in return. Sometimes we go, well, I can receive the love of God when I'm doing good things. You know, when I've done really well this past week, yeah, then I can receive the love of God. Then I, can, then I feel like I'm worthy to receive love. But, you know, when I've had a hard week and I've done some things I wish I didn't do, but then it's like, well, I'm not, I don't really feel worthy to be loved. That's not how God sees it. God loves us. He, got, he loves every part of us. He loves the good things and he loves the bad things. He loves us even when we've, we've done some silly things. Maybe some, even some evil things. He still loves us. The point that I'm making is that to really receive the love of God, we need to accept we need to receive that love into every part of our life, not just the good parts. We need to accept that love, love is not, not conditional. It's not conditional uh, on, on what we did last night or last week or it's not conditional on what we're going to do tomorrow. It has nothing to do with our behaviour. We are loved because he created us. And we need to receive that love. Ever, ever felt unconditionally loved by anyone? Ever felt unconditionally loved by anyone? Ever, ever sat before someone and, you, and they knew the things that were not great about you? No secrets. I mean, they, they, they knew you completely. Ever, ever been in that situation and still felt accepted? Just imagine for a moment that feeling. Maybe you've never felt that. Just imagine for a moment that feeling. That the person that sat before you saw everything that you ever did Ever, every, not only everything that you ever did, everything you ever thought. I guess they knew everything. Just imagine the feeling that they accepted you despite that. They looked you in their eyes and they said, I love you. I still love you. I still accept you. I think that that represents God. I think if, if Jesus was here right now and he had the opportunity to sit physically in front of each of us, I think exactly that, that's exactly what he would communicate. He would look at us and he would say, I know everything you did. It's like, it's like the woman at the well. I know everything you've done, and despite that, I love you. This morning as we finish, I just want us just to close our eyes. And I, wanna, I want you to keep that image in your mind. Because God is here, even though physically... Jesus is not here, God's not here, but he's here through his spirit.
And I can confidently say that he's here with each one of us. And I just want to make space for God to speak to each one of us individually. To communicate in our heart, to communicate in our spirit, the spirit of God communicating to each one of us that message. That as he sits before us this morning, he, even though he, he knows everything we've done, he knows everything that's happened to us, he knows everything we've thought, all the good and all the bad, there's one message he wants to speak to us this morning and that is that he loves us unconditionally. But he doesn't just want us to think that or to receive that in our mind. He wants that to receive that in our heart. To receive that in the depth of our being. I love you. I love you unconditionally. So it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter any, anything you could do. It doesn't matter what you've done. I love you unconditionally. And I love you so much that I want to take you on a journey for you to become all that I've created you to be. It's not enough for me to, let you, to leave you there, but my heart is to help you to lead you, to walk with you so you become everything that I've created you to be. Lord, I just pray that you would speak into the hearts of every person in this place this morning.